Today I'm going to take a look at uh, two three-quarter view attempts and just talk about the basic issues we're seeing there. Um, so there there are definite uh, real, dis like there's a real disproportionate um, like asymmetry happening in this piece. And what I did was I tried to generate a really, really similar situation in Portrait Studio, so I darken the background. We're going to be talking about lighting in a sec. I don't have much of a problem with the background color that you chose, which is really well chosen considering that the shadows are this strong. So if we turn down ambience and we just make these, uh, just make the, the skin just a little darker, you can see that this really does make sense, but if the background was this bright, it really wouldn't make sense that this character is having all this darkness on them or even like up here. But as long as they're like past the mid midway point, it really does make sense that this object comes out of this light environment, which is the uh, the, the dark, unlit, the badly lit room, or that isn't allowing a lot of secondary light source reflection. So almost the exact same situation has been generated here. I'm not sure if you if you did use Portrait Studio to generate this. You probably did, um, and if you didn't, uh, you're just not reading some of the symmetry right. So, let me take a quick look at Liquify and just talk about, whoa, my drivers are all crazy today. So, um, if, like, my, if my mouse goes rogue, you know why. <clears throat> um, so, I'm going to decrease that density and I'm going to try to lift this eyeball up and lower this one. Probably not going to do this successfully on Liquify. I might have to depend on the transform tool to try this. I might have to try it again on the transform tool. But the thing with three-quarter view is it challenges your rotation, how well you can rotate an object. An object that you know very well or very familiar with it in side view, or front view, sorry, but if you rotate it suddenly it's a completely different face. And this is because you guys don't look at the geometry that sits underneath the eyeball or the kind of eyebrow that they have, how that specific kind of eyebrow and its shape and pattern might look through a different angle. So rotating the object and imagining how it might look while it's rotated. So sculpting in three dimensional, like using sculptures, sculpting the image, uh, trying to cre create like a, a sculpture duplicate of your painting, all of that will help you develop um, better rotation in your mind. Rotation is typically how well you can rotate an object in your mind. So me, from from whatever I know about rotation, I know that this character here, though I don't have a previous frame of before they went into three-quarter view, I know that these three quarter, this three-quarter view was disproportionate. So one side, if we had looked at the face, so I'm rotating from the current frame that I had in the before, and if I were to rotate it back to front view, I know one of the eyeballs would have been very, very low. So um, it's just a simple matter, can you do this in your mind? And if you can, then you don't make the mistakes, uh, suddenly this eye drops down here, just because we rotate it. So you guys are so good at painting front view eyes, and there's, there is a line dependency that when you do end up painting a side view eye, it's a flat front view eye squished in the, in the width. It's just squished down, which is exactly what we're seeing here. It's just a side view with front view eye, literally a front view eye, just cut in half instead of the rotation required in which how much more of one eyeball we see or eyelid we see. The fact that we see the, uh, the crease and the brow bone, brow structure first, and then the lashes move out and then it rotates back outside. And that we see the eyeball protrude outside of the outline of the cheekbone. This, is, this all has to do with rotation. <clears throat> so, if we look at the before and after for this one, before, after, that's a severe, severe discrepancy there. And it's, it's the perfect kind of example of where you are currently. So you're, it's good to attempt through quarter view, but the quarter view is like trying a masterpiece. The one useful thing of a masterpiece is it shows you what you don't yet know. It works as a great diagnostic tool. So masterpieces 
um, pushing your rendering power, all of these things help you uh, in, by, by acting as diagnostic tools. Write that back to me. So be aware that this is a current one frame in your art development. This is a current example, a, a microscopic, uh, uh, what's, what's the term, just one study, like one individual instance, separated instance of, of, uh, of one of the issues that you have that, that, that emerged because you attempted a different angle that your mind has no idea how to, how to approach. So this becomes the result. All right. Um, so for the person, I know the person whose, um, qu whose work I'm critiquing is here. So um, do you see the mistake here today? Um, so this, this, the fact that we rotate doesn't change whether or not a line stays horizontal. So this horizontal line, you won't know if it's in the distance and this part is in the distance and this part is in the foreground unless, you know, we do, you know, then we see the thicker part in the foreground and then this part is in the distance and this part is in the foreground because this part is bigger and it's decreasing in size and scale as it goes into a distant point in um, in space. So it's moving past, so it's above the, the horizon line rose up, it means that this is sub whatever kilometers away, this point here, and this point here is closer in foreground. If the canvas looked like that. <clears throat> so when this is the only thing that me that, that shows us the fact that this line has gone in the distance, when we're looking at a line like this, does it change the fact that did the line actually do this? Did the line move down? No, it's still a straight line, it's just the camera that changed its angle. Either the camera is looking at it this way, right, directly at it, or the camera is looking at it from the side. The only thing that changed is us. And that's what you need to teach your brain to do. Teach your brain to see the object from a different angle. But what you did was you probably imagined there would be a, a decreasing in size and for objects in the distance. You probably learned somewhere that objects in the distance are smaller. But they don't necessarily, um, the lines on which they sit, the straight lines and the symmetry lines on which they sit do not bend. Distance does not bend straight lines. The only time where we have this kind of foreshortening and the eye would actually be like this small and the other eye would be this big is if the camera, if you placed your eyeball right on the lens of the camera. So if this is the camera, you placed your eye like right on it. <clears throat> That's when that crazy foreshortening would happen because you've created a massive distance between point A and point B of the line. But the line is still a straight line. Again, it's just a change in the camera. So this mistake is, uh, of course, it's unforgivable because you can't uh, credit it to style. I mean, the style excuse is completely sealed tight. You, there's no style that, that'll help you out of this one. So if you make this mistake with an employer, it'll be very difficult for you to correct this mistake or, or, uh, or um, save yourself from that mistake or save the uh, kind of how, how it's making your art skill look or... Alright, so there's literally no other excuse to say what, what could have possibly caused this today other than the fact that you're not staying true to the straight lines that form the symmetry in between the eyes, so eye 1, eye 2, nose, mouth. We use these straight lines to guide us and when we're doing three quarter view it's the exact same thing. I did a video on three quarter view and I basically explained the, distant, the difference between front view and side view. In the lines, the lines stay exactly straight, it's just that one side gets more line than the other. The balls, we're seeing the side view of the eyeballs. The eyes don't decrease in size at all. They do not decrease in size. There isn't enough distance between the camera, between both eyes and the camera. Like they're, They are both at equal distance from the camera, therefore there won't be any foreshortening. Alright, so this is three-quarter view. And then the nose, usually we have the nose, if you guys remember the, the example for the nose, um, open bracket, close bracket, slit, slit, and then the triangle. So you still draw your triangles, it's just that one side gets more than the other. The tip of the nose is off-center, nostril one, 
and then you have a pretty good three-quarter view uh, outline happening here that stays true to the line. So one line emerging from the inner corner of the eye going down, and that's typically where both nostrils should be. So this distance is already even addressed, the fact that one eye is closer than the other. And, uh, and that's it, really. You just have to remember that everything is off-center with three-quarter view, but lines don't bend. The, the, the line, uh, some, sometimes you guys uh, bend this line like that, and then the, 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 <laughs> the vertical symmetry line goes, goes a little something like that. Uh, there's no reason why you guys shouldn't straighten these lines and keep them straight, even after, like, all of these lines should pretty much hit the same eye, unless they're all tilting on the same angle. But they all seem to be following, like, a different this nostril tip, this nostril tip, at least I corrected a lot, I guess. Um, they should all be parallel. All right, and the only time they're not parallel when they do this is if the person's eyeball is right by the camera. And they're like, ooh, they're just looking at the camera. Like that. Okay? So in front view, there is one eye space in between both eyes. Um, I'll, it'll, I'll there be one will there be one eye space in between for three quarter view? Yes, but one side has more a daisy. And this whole one eye thing, it isn't always going to work. Sometimes there will be more than one eye, sometimes there will be less than one eye distance between both eyes, depending on the kind of face. The more beautiful the eye, the more space you want between both eyes. But the face has to it has to fit into the face. It can't be just completely separated. Um, and like completely, uh, like um, probably seeing two lines of vision or something like that. And they can't be too close together because that would be the ogre. So you have to remember it's not always a perfect eye's width, but you can just eyeball it. It's, it's, you can round it up or round it down however you need to. But in three quarter view, one side has more than the other side. That's it. This side has more. All right, so trust your measurements, trust your lines, because if you don't, you will end up making mistakes like this. Horizontals are not affected by three-quarter view. Lines stay straight in three-quarter view. Write that back to me. This actually might be a short class today because there isn't much to paint over. Um, I wonder if my liquify changed too much. Uh, for this eye, I feel like you're drawing this eye from uh, a front view kind of kind of deal. So we would actually see more of this eyelid. If this eye is looking this way, we see more of this inner eyelid. And we see less of the outer eyelid. We, we, we can't see the outer eyelid at all. It stops. All right, and then we get a little bit more white under the eye, so we have less of that. Just a little bit more. Just so that I could show where that ball sits. And then this one, we actually have more of this side and less of this side. Exactly the same deal. We're looking at the eye from the side view. We're looking at the eyeball from a side view on both instances. The outer corner, so front view eye looks like this. All right, we've got corner, corner. You can see both corners, they're both exposed equally on the canvas, on, on to the camera. And side view does something like this. What happened, this line turns into that. It turns into a cross section. And this outer corner becomes invisible. So this, co out, this inner corner isn't invisible, but this one is. We don't see this one anymore. It's just tucked away behind the volume of the eye. The volume of the eye moves along a z-axis, which is this. This is a z-axis. This is x. This is x. And that's z. This, this, this way, this way, this way, or this way, at whatever angle, just as long as it's not straight. <clears throat> depending on which angle you're looking at the cube. So if it's front view cube or side view cube, I'm really messing these cubes up. But this is all the Z right here that connects these two faces together. 
if you don't know what the z-axis is, you don't know, um, like you haven't added it to your practice to draw diagrams before you attempt to draw these uh, to fully paint, then you're doing yourself an, like an amazing disservice. If you're not thinking in diagrams, if you're not replacing this that is in your mind when I say I, if you're not replacing this with a diagram with this, you're never going to be able to paint through quarter view or rotate successfully because you're not looking at the real side, what the, what the z-axis, what the cube is following. So when I say cube, think of the cube, I just mean the Cartesian plane, which is this x, y, and z. And this fits in all kinds of objects that can fit into a sphere. It can make a cube. It can make a triangle or a pyramid. It's just always there. This, this z aspect is, is always there. All right, so stop thinking in symbols, stop seeing in symbols, because when you do three-quarter view, it's going to happen. You aren't going to be thinking in volume. Instead of thinking in symbols, think in volume. Volume is illustrated or uh, uh, pointed to with diagrams. So draw more diagrams to perfect your rotation. So the diagnosis is you don't know how to rotate in your mind. The cure is form studies. The theory is the diagram behind it. All right, the theory for the cure is that typically you're supposed to be introducing yourself to the illustration of the volume, to the, the approaching it scientifically. Start with the geometry. So that's why I'm always repeating these words, and I'm always going to repeat these words in my teaching career because they are, they are the words to look for. This is your terminology. These, these should be your holy book. If you don't think about the geometry in this way, and as I've, as I've broken it down for you here, you will mis make these mistakes constantly. <clears throat> so uh, what was missing, that last little bit that was missing is all of this extra mathematics behind it that you didn't have there. So that's it, that's the cure. If you don't have to tra you don't have to travel across the desert in search of you know on a spirit journey to find what the answer is to boost your art to that next level. You don't have to follow a 15,000 artists on Instagram or Facebook to get to this next level. All you have to do is know that this is what is not happening in my work. This is what my practice is lacking. This is the theory that I don't have. These are the terms that I don't use. Okay. I can rotate in my mind. It's the pencil I have trouble with. Um, if you can see the object in your mind rotated vividly in your mind's eye, you can, you can almost see it, your pencil will follow suit. Okay. Your pencil will follow. If your pencil is if you see, feel this anxiety in your hand when you're drawing and you have this this real desire to just draw the symbol because it'll read fast that is that starts in your brain you can't blame your hand your hand is just a tool it all starts with your brain if you're not rotating in your work you're not rotating in your brain and a lot of this is mileage so if you guys don't have the mileage if you guys don't have this if you're not exposing yourself to these kinds of words over many weeks you simply will not be on a on, on, on a road to curing this this very flat 2d world kind of like um, like Carl Sagan's 2d 2d landers or flat landers you'll be stuck there you will always think like a flat line flat lander in your mind <clears throat> okay so just off to unfollow some artist. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see what everyone's asking. Uh, there is discussion section on the Google page. Uh, but I still feel like I have no perspective imagination, as if I was not able to understand form. Um, the, the fact that you don't have it is, is, is good that you notice you don't have it, but the fact that you think you don't have it, it should be really, really obvious in your art. If it's obvious and the diagnostic is just like screaming uh, for some form or for some perspective or better perspective, it just means uh, that's so simple to know what to do next. And it's just to start drawing some diagrams of the features you want to perfect. So start dra drawing diagrams of eyes, draw diagrams of nose uh, of noses, look up uh, medical diagrams of noses. So this is not wasted time um, just doing this. Alright, 
so uh, medical diagram nose and this will not only you know, show you the actual geometry, so where are those three-quarter view versions? There's almost never a three-quarter view version of like the cross-section of a nose. Um, you know, one half is open, one half isn't. Very hard to find. This is perfect. Shows you where the bone is. You just have to Google this and look for what you need to find. So where is it? I know I found one for my student once. This right here is actually a pretty good one. Just shows you where everything is. No. But that's what, what it is typically. You just have to look for these medical diagrams. They have that. Beware, you might find some weird medical procedure pictures, but um, you, you will find the overlap between the three-dimensional, especially look for three-quarter view diagrams as well. Um, the layering of the anatomy, where the bone is, and then you can see the basic pyramid shape in the nose. You can just see it right there projected um, through your mind's eye on anything you're looking at. You can see the three-quarter views right away. Um, but before, and we're seeing so much of this upper eyelid, we wouldn't be able to see that much. What we're trying to do is show it in this perspective that we're seeing the top of the eye. So in perspective, you're asking yourself, you know, you guys are drawing like this. You're drawing cubes like this. And I want to really force you, you guys probably do, you know, something like this, and then you show the side view. So pay close attention, because I'm only doing this once. All right, so some of you see this when I say cube, a basic red circle. Basic red cube, sorry basic red circle. Basic red box. So these are the levels right now, the levels of art. The, this, is, this is the levels, this is beginner. Beginner draws something like this. Someone who's starting to experiment with shading will start drawing a cube like this. Alright? They're gonna tell us that this is the z-axis. Alright? I don't even know what a z-axis is, but I know I have to shade one half of this. Some of you will shade a cube and go over this line. Some of you won't go over this line. You'll stay right on this line. You'll know where that line is. The next level, as you get better, you start drawing the cube like this. All right, but still, there's always something lacking here. This is still the main thing that you depend on. You're still so dependent on this. And then the final level, in my opinion, is when you can draw cubes, or one of the final levels, so this line and this line are parallel still, like this. And this is a pretty good level. Once you're at this level, you're pretty much, you know, you feel like, yeah, nobody can fuck with me. I can draw objects and see this, the top of the object, so I know where I am in relation to the object. I am above the object. If I'm below the object, I'll know. I know the side of the, uh, the object and how it moves into the distance and loses shape because of scale. I know that this is the z-axis. And then some of you do a little something like that. Well, this is part of the final position. Um, no, no, no. This way. All right. And we're having cubes that look like this. or we're seeing the top top of one cube or the bottom of another. Oops. <clears throat> All right, sometimes we see the top of this cube and it's and it's extreme uh, like the worm's eye. Sometimes we don't see either bottom or top. Sometimes it moves off into the distance like that. And what am I drawing right now? Can anyone tell me what I'm drawing? What am I experimenting with? I'm experimenting with perspective along some forms, and I'm using lines. So this is what I mean. I'm reverse engineering the usefulness of form studies. You don't have to draw a nose to get to this level before you start experimenting with a nose. So imagine all the, others, all the other geometries you haven't experimented with yet. So some of you draw triangles like this. Some of you try to draw triangles like this. You still have the same baseline. Some of you draw triangles like this and you actually have a z-axis as soon as that z-axis is visible it's like yes 
all right so um it's it's so important that that we start teaching ourselves this terminology determine am i here am i here am i here am i here can i draw organic objects suspended in space and rotate them through different frames as if I was the animating engine and I can animate the perspective of every single one of these objects and rotate them uh, the way a 3D modeling program rotates an object, rotates a form. So once you start doing that, nothing will sneak up on you. No reference, no kind of nose, no kind of lighting situation will ever sneak up on you because your, 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 your core understanding is based off real sciences. All right. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Where do you guys know which 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 uh, of these boxes you you fall under? Do you guys know that you know these lines all stayed straight and horizontal? None of these lines were warped. There's no way to warp it unless you're warping the light source or destroying the eye that's seeing the object. <clears throat> so that's rotation. That's what rotation means. A lot of people ask me about what I mean when I say rotation in my diagnostic, and this is what I mean. That you're not, you're not, you can't act, you're not acting as a conscious camera. You are a flatlander. <clears throat> I feel like I have a lot of knowledge, but technical skills are very lacking. Um, technical skills, I, when I, whenever someone says technical skills, I'm, I'm, I, what, I, what I read, what I see is how you hold your brush kind of brush you use. Um, line efficiency, I guess, can, can, kind of can be related to it, but line efficiency is still a cautiousness and a fear and not enough blueprint in your mind or geometry in your mind, but I, I can't even say line efficiency or hairy lines. Like when someone says technical, like the technical parts, the technical aspects, I just think not knowledge related. So if you feel like you have, an, again, I told you guys, if you have an, a lot of knowledge, you, it would show in your work. You wouldn't be able to unlearn the z-axis. You can't unlearn it. You can step back and break some rules intentionally and paint like this for the style. So this is a really cute cartooning style. Here when you have, so what cartooning styles fall under this? Um, probably like the Fairly Odd Parents style where, um, you know, everybody is flat and you've got like the far leg, both legs like on an exact line and it's a really, really flat animating style. Right, this guy is really suspicious of you right now. His ear, his ear and his hair, like there is literally no frame behind him. He's, he's just a paper cutout. And then you've got <clears throat> this kind of animating style, which is probably like anything to do with the z-axis. So you've got like the Ghibli style, any kind of major advanced anime style or cartooning style that we've seen where we actually have hands that have a z-axis that really act and really and have emotion and mechanics to them. All right, so these guys and these guys are deliberately breaking rules. <clears throat> so if you are saying, I have this knowledge, but I don't have the technical skills for it, no, it's not like that. You are accidentally in some of these styles right now. You are not conscious of the mistakes you're making, and it's not as much knowledge as you think you have. So all of this, even though it sounds like it, m it makes sense to you, it doesn't mean that you knew it before. Just because it makes sense to you doesn't mean I can see it in your art. A lot of students, when I'm lecturing them, will say, oh, that makes so much sense. If it made sense, why don't I see it in your work? It's because you never had this active vocabulary. You are familiar with the terminology, but you're not fluent in it. You have to make yourselves fluent. Do not create excuses. Do not excuse yourself and, and, and find issues with some other aspect, some you know weird other margin in your, in your skill set look for the real core issue and that the real core issues are almost always related to an to a, a, an inexperience with the z-axis and an undeveloped geometry language a lot of maths unfortunately <clears throat> does someone know how to avoid drawing really long eyes okay for more than five months now long eyes um, I think you have a habit of drawing long eyes, and the way to stop it is to pre-measure or, or, or draw something beforehand, like lines or some kind of outline to stop it. Look for references and do some reference studies. So to cut it, to nip it in the bud, is to identify that it's not a style, it's a habit, and start working from references from realistic eyes, not another person's art. Do not ever reference another person's art. Master studies are only useful for studying the technique. 
um, what their paint, the painting is like, what, what their color choice is like, uh, what their texture looks like, how they mess around with their brush. Um, but you have to go to a real source, look up a real eye reference to stop yourself from drawing eyes because you're going to have a little bit left over, but the referencing practice that you did take will have removed a lot of the length or the width from those eyes. Um, draw the eyeball first and wrap the eyelids around it. Experiment with different eyelid shapes and uh, degree of openness. Yes. You have to learn the rules before you break the rules. Um, yeah, measuring stuff out. Exactly. Everyone knows the answer to this, this one. Yes. Measure stuff out. Do not ever reference another person's art. Yes. The only reason why it's useful is to just look at their technique and color choice and habits. Uh, but if you're practicing and studying off someone's work, you'll inherit their good good traits and inherit their bad habits. Yeah. <clears throat> um, right now, Sline War, you're looking through the lens of your of your habits. You are looking through the lens of your predisposition. You will never be able to fix it on your own, Sline War. That's why a community is so important. You'll never be able to really fix it on your own, without using references, I mean. You have to bring in an external source of information that will change how you look at eyes and how you remember eyes. If I were to ask you to draw a really basic symbol or clip art of an eye, you would probably give me a really long eye, just with your raw knowledge and raw brain power. Um, in order to interrupt the faults or the hiccups in that brain power and what you have in your memories, you have to look at references and study them for quite a bit of time so that your brain can, I mean, on average, I think I read it takes between three weeks or, or, or two weeks to develop, between two and three weeks to develop a habit up to a month. Um, so that's why I always say at least two weeks, that's why the 14 day challenge is at least two weeks of doing the same thing. Give your brain a chance to develop new pathways, new ways of thinking, new words, find new patterns in thought, new patterns in approaching a very, very difficult subject to break down. All right, but the way to defeat something is to break it down brick by brick, and, and you'll be able to do that. Istabrak, when should I do form studies? As soon as possible. Today. As soon as this class is done, open up a gray canvas and just start using your lasso and mess around with some forms. If you have to sketch it by line first, sketch it by lines. Um, but um, the point is that you're replacing your lines with form, and you're replacing, uh, you're, you're eventually, well, before I started doing form studies, I could never draw a rock. I sucked at drawing rocks. Like, I'm, I don't know what to tell you. I couldn't draw a rock. I would look at the way people drew rocks, and I'm like, how the fuck did you do that, son of a bitch? How did you do that? Um, and I started doing form studies. After I did that, I was like, why did these rocks ever, why were they ever so difficult or complicated to me? Like, I'm trying to figure out why they ever scared me, why I never why they always scared me <laughs> and it was because I just didn't have anything any language it was like looking at an object you've never seen before you had no language to understand what you were looking at how could you possibly have have had anywhere to place it in your brain and that's where the confusion sourced from um, so form studies you don't know how blind you are till you learn form studies and then you realize oh my god I've been blind this whole time this whole time and now I now I can see Right right now, you don't know how bad you are. Write that back to me. <laughs> Basically, you don't know how bad you suck right now. And you probably suck way more than you think you do. I probably suck way more than I think I do. And I won't know until I do enough of the thing that I don't know, which is why masterpieces are a good diagnostic. Because they let you see, oh my god, this whole time, I really don't know how to draw glass. And that was what happened when I painted that um, that, that villain painting, that, that train wreck. Um, is, is I just realized I didn't know how to draw glass and I'm just l sitting there looking at my reference and I'm like good god I have, this is probably like one of the sixth like the sixth time I've ever drawn glass in my entire life <laughs> like I've never drawn glass before this like a couple times obviously but you know not enough it was never enough it was never two weeks worth of study so um, you know still lifes forms uh, that's why they make an artist better because you're you're never you're always on your toes. The form and the z-axis will always be there, challenging your geom the ge your your language, and geometries, your geometry language. <clears throat> I'm bad. I don't know how bad how much I suck yet. Exactly. No, Tiv, you're not ugly. I'm not asking you to say you're ugly and you're proud. <laughs> 
No, no, no. It's just, it's, you know, you have to look at yourself, point the camera at yourself, point your, point your critique power at yourself and realize if I didn't know how to, if I didn't know I was drawing, if I didn't know how to draw rocks, right? So let's say I, I, I didn't know how to draw rocks. How else did that, where else did that show? So the, it showed a lot with rocks. I tried to draw rocks and I sucked. I always ended up drawing mushy sand piles. Um, and I wondered why I kept drawing sand piles. And um, again, I realized that this must have manifested, this mistake, this lack of knowledge must have manifested in the way I drew noses, in the way I drew fabric. I probably didn't know the rises and falls on the fabric, the reflective power, where the z-axis was, where the cube was, the power of the edge. I always over-blended, which is why they looked like sand piles. I never stopped blending. I didn't know where not to blend. <clears throat> and it's a balance between where to blend and where not to blend. So. You know, it, it, it wasn't just in rock. So once I fixed that and I, I broke it down and I did some form studies and I developed a really weird looking, uh, you know, uh, pyramid and that pyramid was broken into more polys and it got more and more and more polys on it, added to it that I could introduce myself slowly. So start with really simple geometries and form studies and slowly ease into the complicated ones because that's how you, you know, that's how you slowly break it down brick by brick. <clears throat> and then I suddenly could draw rocks just like that. And drawing rocks just like that made me draw clouds better because I knew it was all about the blending with the clouds and where not to blend. So I knew I, I had an eye for where that cube really was, even even on the cloud level. Noses, I, I knew exactly how much to show in a nose and how much not to show in three-quarter view. And all these form studies just started to fix everything. It's like a medicine or an antibiotic you throw through your body. And even though the illness has manifested, and symptoms everywhere across the body, this one thing will go into your bloodstream and correct everything, go at the root, and automatically, simultaneously, everything will just collapse. And all these different ways that this lack of knowledge manifested into symptoms throughout your work will be broken down by, by fixing this one issue, which is an, an inability to rotate geometry in your brain. And the fact that you're not rotating geometry in your brain is stopping you from ever improving. You will always suck in that way. <clears throat> Even if you don't study right now, if you're just sitting here and all, all, all you did was this one hour that you gave yourself and your hobby, and you sat today with us for this one hour, that is enough to introduce the, the terminology to your brain. Just that, just sitting here with us today is study. Because you're, you're, you're hearing me use these words, so your brain is starting to get used to hearing these words. And your brain will start to speak in those words very, very soon. It'll, that's the best the way to learn language, really, is just sit there and listen. Um, but uh, that's my rant about this today. So I could go ahead and paint all of these over for you and tell you where these issues are and slide, glide over them very, very uh, lightly. But um, <clears throat> I feel like rotation is one of the biggest issues. Uh, there's line dependency, there's color, uh, not working in grayscale for long enough. Um, there's all these other issues beginners uh, suffer from, but this is one of the biggest be beginner issues that will leave you with beginner symptoms for the rest of your art career. Even if you pretend and find ways to fool people into thinking you're a master the way I do, um, you will, uh, it will, the, these beginner mistakes will manifest in their way. Some way or another, they will be visible. You always have to leave yourself um, better today than you were yesterday and you don't do that by not facing the, tr the truth and facing the facts that you suck more than you think you do and you're not as good as you think you are <clears throat> all right so whoa that's a big question how to defeat depression for illustrators um i've come to terms with my the way that that is in my life because i know i have that um, this, this depression that I have is uh, it's very different from the, from the usual traditional terms of it and the way it kind of has made me kind of form into this like evil, really, really insufferable perfectionist with everything that I do around the house and in my job and, and, and just the way I drive. Everything has to have is like a response to the way this, this depression works. <clears throat> but I realized that the way to correct it, because it, it inhibits more than it provides, um, uh, so what it did for me is that it made me work harder. So I would look at my work and say, oh my God, you piece of shit, you suck so bad. Go learn how to draw. So I, it was like a really mean sensei, like Pai Mei from Kill Bill, but it still sucked being told that you suck, right? It still sucked. 
and not just told that you suck, being told by yourself, to yourself, when no one else is around, that you are the scum of the world and you don't know how to draw, and you should quit now, and, and you're never going to get where you want to be, and you're never going to be successful. That little voice, in its own right, made me draw better. But that little voice, as it added to my skill, it took from my confidence. So when it was taken from my confidence, it took from my self-love. And I realized that perfectionism is a very lonely road. And it's not at all, you're going to end up really, really skilled, but you're not going to have the spirit left to draw anything else because you've been beating the shit out of yourself for the last 15 years of practice. So I realized that possibly it was an art causing this depression. So if you do have depression, and this is like, there's a normal amount of depression we all go through, we, sometimes we need to be sad. It's just the way the brain corrects itself. It doesn't always enter a high state of happiness. Um, the neutral state is actually the healthy place to be. Uh, so neither ha happy nor depressed is a good place to be, but it's still it's part of the cycle. Emotions are a very complicated thing for the brain to process. So there is a healthy amount of it involved that is supposed to be there. It's not You're never going to get really get rid of it. And then there's a clinical amount where you do have to seek some kind of professional... Uh, voice to guide you through um, addressing what could possibly be what, what it could possibly be because almost always it's not art that's making you depressed you're just an artist with a depression that's come out of something else before something before made you depressed before you became an artist that you should probably address <clears throat> because I know so many artists that have depression and they think they're clinically depressed and I'm like listen buddy this is the average amount you're supposed to have this much so you're not clinical and then I do come across those really really clinical clinically depressed artists and I'm and I'm just wondering how they're keeping up and they every manifests in the way they talk about themselves and how aggressive they are, how mean they are, how cruel they are to other people. And I'm just like, this is just someone screaming in pain because I know that this is real depression. So I can tell when someone's just, you know, an, a little attention whore and I can tell when someone's really depressed. So there's an average amount to identify which one you are. It could possibly be the one that is the worst one. And to deal with it as an artist, there's no diagram for me to show you that you can get better. There's no self-help book that I wrote. If it's clinical, if you find yourself really incapable of drawing, incapable of doing t basic tasks like waking up in the morning, you have to go and look for professional help. They will really, really help you. They will actually cure you. Not cure you, but they will, they will show you you can cure yourself, that there are ways that you can manage it for long enough that it no longer it's not, not going to be there anymore for you to need to manage it. All right, so can, don't confuse yourself with clinically de clinical depression. If you're not clinically depressed, please be, remember that it's okay to be sad and not every day. You're not gonna you're not gonna draw the best stuff every single day. Relax and realize that if you're doing form studies, you are on a really really good direction, on a really really good path to improving as a whole. The the the, the all of the stuff, all of that disease that is in you that is not allowing you to get better, and it's going to be like that antibiotic. The form studies, the still lifes, the geometry studies, the um, the grayscale studies, staying away from lines, all of these things will in themselves improve your art in the way you want it to. If you're still depressed after that, please, please, please look for professional help, and that's all I can say about that. <clears throat> I'm not a um, I'm not a, I'm not a professional in that, uh, not at all. I'm not a, a doctor. <clears throat> uh, clinical depression requires professional intervention and professional diagnosis, but I realize that's really hard to get in some communities. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who knows how to defeat, defeat lack of motivation? Some days I'm super motivated and I love drawing, other days I'm so ugh. Um, I think there's a creative pressure. Don't, don't confuse depression with just be, having anxiety. I think there is like an like an epidemic of anxiety with artists. They all, they're all under this um, uh, like pressure to be creative, that they think they have to be creative every single day, once every 24 hours. I don't know what kind of brains you guys think you have, but my brain is not made of the way like Megatron's brain. My brain is made of fat and flesh, and it's really, really weak, and it's, and it's, not, it's not on overdrive, and I'm probably using like really really small margin of its capacity so I'm not gonna be able to to manifest like create these amazing pieces um, every 24 hours it's just not gonna happen maybe once every week I can draw something that really looks nice 
but uh, but be, to be it comes in cycles. Creativity for me comes in cycles, even in seasons. I can say, and it, I'm not always going to draw the best stuff, but when I do, every time that I do these long breaks that I take, my, my drawings get better. So I have study stage where I have like two months of study and then I have just pure, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist stage. I'm going to do creative things. And I put those skills that I was studying for the past two months into something creative. And then I bury those in the ground and just get over them and stop worshiping them and then go on to another cycle or season of study. So if you are, if you find yourself depressed and not clinically depressed, just regular depressed, maybe it's not that, maybe it's anxiety because you are under a lot of creative pressure or pressure to be a creative and stop that please <laughs> and just study, just study. If you remove the creative pressure, you really will study better. Um, you'll focus better. Uh, you won't be lured by the devil of art <clears throat> into turning that study into a masterpiece. And I know a lot of you do that. A lot of the stuff that I look at starts as a study and I can tell you guys put a little hairpin there and a little gun there and a sword there and it just becomes a masterpiece <laughs> um, uh, so I, at least you drew a sword you know what I'm saying but but yeah just remember you don't have to always be creative <clears throat> all right yes kill your babies <laughs> Uh, but that's it for today. If you guys liked what you saw, um, go to isterag.com. I'll be posting this lesson, and I post all other lessons on YouTube. So if you guys want to subscribe and like over there. Um, we figured out why some of you aren't getting a notification for, 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 uh, for subscriptions. And it's just because, let's see one of the people I've subscribed to. So Saul de Blasi here. <laughs> He's a tiling genius. You just gotta click this, and then this little this little bell right here. If you go to my p page and you just click this, look at him. He's just the best. He's such a he's such an amazing person. All right, <clears throat> um, you just click here, and then you show you show send me all notifications for this channel, and it will notify you when I go live or or if I am just streaming my sketches, which I might tonight. All right, so you just gotta go here. I, I have all subscriptions turned off because I. I don't like getting spam. Um, but if you're not like that, if you have more patience than me, turn on that little bell. Uh, Google Plus is where I pick all of these pieces from. Uh, so you could just have to go to Google Plus and hand in your work. The Creepy Creature Challenge is due on the 27th. So you guys have a little bit more than a week to complete your drawing. A lot of people have been submitting some amazing work uh, for the Creepy Creature Challenge. And um, I, I really, I'm so tempted to render some of these already, but the ones that I choose at the end, I'll probably render those uh, for you guys. So I'll probably do a quick render. Uh, choose one of these sketches and just render it and give it to you. Um, okay, so subscribe on YouTube. Join the Google Plus community. Make sure you follow the rules of the community. You can't post certain things. You can't post in certain ways. Uh, there's just a lot of rules for you guys to follow. Uh, where are the rules? Where, where are the rules? <laughs> uh, I don't see the rules. Oh, I might be on the... Am I on a different... Oh, no, 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 I'm not on the... Sorry. The rules are right here. <laughs> I was on the theme submissions page. The rules are right here. Please read them before joining. Fa uh, Facebook is where you guys can message me if you want your paint over sent back to you. And Twitter is where I announce ca class cancellations or class delays. Uh, usually it's 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, but sometimes it's at 5.30, sometimes it's at 6, depending on how my schedule looks, because I have other students as well. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. You guys are amazing. I will see you guys on Thursday. Bye-bye.